with attachment and family therapy. And let me tell you, I've been a 25 years and I started in foster care. My placement for years, they were six to 12 years old and place them in a pre-adoptive when I was preparing the parent, the foster parents and acclimate. I find they didn't, I didn't have enough tools. I looked for training on working with a parent and child resources. I felt really lost. I thought maybe this is a therapist of one of the children who, who I was placing in a pre-adoptive home and asked, can you help me? Can you do that? I don't want to bring the pre-adoptive parents into my session with the child because that'll create a relationship between me and the child. I didn't understand what that meant, but it was something that struck it was a, a the idea of I want, I want to preserve the the relationship one hour a week, not mix it up with, with the other hundred and sixty eight hours a week that the uh, parent is going to the foster parent they they already were, were having serious issues one child or uh, that the the foster parent had made by hand herself and cut them. Another child terrorizing another one pooped in the corner of the living room. And so when I was really up against the wall, I started researching any training that I thought would be helpful. Focused. This was in 1999, and I found TheraPlay. And those two pieces really together, I, I, they formed the basis for all they were so, so useful to me. And since, since then, I've evolved and added, as well as Holly and, and I've been and practicing not, not just with, with uh, adopting bio families that are having tr tr trouble, various issues. They don't know issues that are, are abuse and neglect or separation and loss. There's a lot of reasons in a dyad and a lot of ways is that attachment can help. The perspective I really want to focus on is bringing the parent and child together in therapy and working on and not the child or the parent, but the relationship. And that's the most, most important aspect that I've integrated into this one model and in the I'm gonna uh, about an hour and 20 minutes from now and before then I'll have a time for for question and answer that we've okay Items and the references I'm going to make to in this training, I wrote them in the book that uh, came out, Integrative Attachment Family. So you would, if you're interested in more details, you would find them in this book. And let's just go over the main aspects of the, the model. 
Okay, so we talked about the fact that this is a relationship focused therapy. So it's not taking the child in separately and then talking to the parent separately. They're together in the sessions. The idea of being together when the parent and child are in the sessions together, the idea is I want to focus on inner subjectivity between the caregiver and the child on a nonverbal level. So what I mean by that is it's a physiologic communication. When you have a baby and you're in, if you're looking from the point of view of attachment theory, your whole demeanor with a baby, when you're holding them, for example, they're colicky or they have pain in their tummy, you're going to rock them and shush them and hold them. And you're going to bounce them and sway and talk in a melodic voice, say, they're there. I got you. Oh, I know it. Having that whole, that whole body experience that the child is having when they're being held by a parent who's attuned helps the baby to feel calm and secure. And it even helps the pain to go down somewhat just because somebody else is sharing the pain with me. So we have to think about it from that perspective before any other perspective, like content thinking or uh, a narrative perspective. The other thing is we need to work on creating joy, connection, and experiences of caregiving in the, in, uh, in the sessions with a parent and child. Therapy has to be fun and it has to be a, an experience that a child is looking forward to. The, the kinds of interactions that parents and infants play together, like the little peekaboo games and things like that, those create moments of joy and connection. And those are really, really important for attachment. So you'll see that the therapy that I'm espousing is really focused on having fun and pleasure. Another aspect of it is that there should be a part of each session where we have constructive dialogue. It's, I call it a deliberate dialogue where the therapist in, uh, helps the parent and the child have a conversation that is productive. What I mean by that, it means we're not going to we're not going to solve the problem necessarily. I'm not here to solve or just work on um, finding techniques. I'm wanting the parent and the child to share their mind and for the parent to be able to understand the child and to keep it regulated. A lot of times parents will start lecturing and then the child um, becomes dysregulated and upset. And the, uh, the whole tone changes to something that's negative. And I want a conversation, even if it's for 10 minutes, to be something positive. That's the whole focus. One feature of this is that the parent is the fo much of the, the, the sessions are going to be focused on the parent only. The parent is going to meet with the therapist at least every four session is a, is a parent session only. And this is something that the parent needs to be prepared for and sign so that they know what they're signing up for. Because parents might think, oh, I'm bringing my child for therapy and I'm going to drop them off and then I'll come in every once in a while for some parent coaching or some debriefs. And the idea is the parent is the one who is going to do a lot of the work on their, they're going to work on their own issues, their own attachment history. They're going to be asked to work on their own regulation. And so you'll see that a really strong aspect of IAFT, which is what I call this program, IAFT, is working with a parent directly you as the therapist with the parent and the child is not present. That's at least every four session is a parent session only. Okay, so here, these are the main elements of the program. Let's get into details. Okay, I call this a phase. There are phases. 
The first phase is the preparation where you're going to work with a parent only, and that's about five sessions with a parent only. I typically will use the first session for an intake about the child's background, their 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 pregnant the pregnancy history, the birth, the developmental history, the tra trauma history, certainly things that you've already been familiar with uh, as a, as a therapist. In the second and third sessions, if there's two parents, but just one parent, then in the second session, I go over the parents that use a questionnaire from Dan Siegel's Parenting from the Inside Out, which is called Questions for Parent Self-Reflection. And it's, it's based on the adult attachment interview. So that's really important for me to know about the, the parent's own attachment our the ideas our own attachment and how we were raised affects how we react to our kids and the parents need to become familiar with that idea and become familiar with what issues are being triggered by their by their child with whom they're having the problems i then give them um, an assignment to read a case handout and what that is it is a way of speaking with a child about difficult topics and pace stands for playful accepting curious and empathic you will see we're going to i'm going to talk to you about pace and give you examples and then you'll be able to understand that further the reason i give them that handout them to read it but also they all they're going to need to practice it so in sessions four and five i help the parent by practicing pace with them first they are their child and i'm them so we do some role playing it's really necessary to experience it and not just to say oh yeah i read the handout and i tried it at home because then they'll say i tried it and it didn't work so there is a portion that's didactic and experiential that is really a training program and then those every once we start the dyadic sessions in phase two every four session is still a parent session only because they still need to practice so there's quite a level of of rigor for the parent to um to to change essentially and to take responsibility So phase two is the dyadic work, dyadic work. So a dyad is a couple, it's two people. I am talking about one parent and the child. I wanna choose which parent I'm gonna work with first. I do not want both parents and the child or a parent and two children. I want a dyad. It is much harder to keep everybody's dynamics in check. There's so much going on when you have a bunch of people in the room. And the attachment relationship between a child and their parent is specific to that caregiver. So I want to be able to isolate that subunit within the family. If later on we have both parents or we have some, several siblings, that's okay. But my recommended mode is to work with the parent A, whoever it is that maybe is the one who needs the most help. Usually it's the one who's most readily available because the other parent works late or lives for whatever the uh, issue is i found that typically there's one parent who's the one who's going to be coming to therapy but the second parent is not important in fact i do switch and work with the second parent in in the, the subsequent phase so there's two to three parent and child sessions followed by at least every four session is a parent session only and that's the that's the format it goes in that cycle There's often a need for a third phase, a third phase, which is called the parent focused work. There are, this is what I found frequently after a certain chunk of work has been done and you've made some gains, initial improvements, and maybe the enthusiasm is now wearing off or the parent is showing you their they're more 
negative or depressive side. They may came, you know, may they came in enthusiastic and wanting to, you know, have their guard up and protect their image. And and then maybe they've had a lot of hope, but now they're more sober because they see that things aren't changing quickly. They come in to the parent only session and they say, I am, um, you know, I'm trying all the things you said, but they didn't work. Um, I'm really discouraged. And that's the time to work with the parent alone for a series of sessions. And what I like to do is tell parents ahead of time, this is going to happen. We're going to have a time when we're going to work together for about maybe two or maybe five sessions, just the two of us, five sessions in a row, because we're going to need to do some focused work. And during that focused work, that those those that phase three, I have exercises that I do with the parents. One of them is the polyvagal map that is referenced in the book. I won't have time to go over all of these elements, but these are the things, these are the uh, elements that I found have been the most helpful for parents. I've also created a guided meditation for parents for them to be able to help tune into what are they reactive to? What is the most react? Why do they react with anger or hopelessness or pleading or desperation with their child? And get in down to the root of that and then practice self-regulation skills through breathing and through self-compassion messages. So that's something that I've created that's in the book. And then the emphasis during those, those, those sessions is to help a parent really think about having good boundaries, having self-care, being responsible for the cycle of rupture and repair. So these are very important themes that, that I develop in these sessions. Now, then we are, if the, the, we've successfully gone through phase three, then either we re we return to phase two. That's what it should say on that. There's a mistake on this on the slide. Return to phase two, or you can switch to the other parent if that's relevant. Okay. So the most important thing that I want you to get out of this idea of the phases is first, there is a very strong first phase is about five sessions with a parent only. Okay. The second uh, phase, even though that's the dyadic phase where you're working with the parent and child together, there's still a really important component where every fourth session at least is a parent session only. And then there is also a third phase that's it's 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 optional, but it comes up more often than not that we need focused and concentrated time with the parent alone, and then you would not see the child. So maybe two to five sessions with the um, parent only. Why am I emphasizing this? Because you would need to tell the parents about this when they ring you up or what you might put it on your website or for people who are working in agencies, you would need your, your organization's help and approval to, to explain this, this method at the beginning, because if people don't know what they're getting into, they're going to be they're going to be confused. They will not have time. They won't be able to organize their schedule and so on. So it's really for people for for clients maybe who have tried individual therapy for their child or have gone maybe to parenting classes or something that those those configurations they may be only helped somewhat or they didn't help enough, okay? So this is really a model for people who are looking for the family therapy approach that has a very strong emphasis on, on parents. And some people immediately say, well, you know, my, my, the parents I work with, they just drop the kid off. Uh, okay, so I think it's really important to tell the parents ahead of time and let them know that we're, we won't be working together if you just drop the kid off it's not possible you're going to be the main source of the healing 
and you're the most important person to your child. And that's why we're asking you to be front and center. So let's get into some of the details here. Well, here is one of the important uh, attributes of IAFT, the therapist, you. The IAFT therapist has to have a really strong presence in the room, a strong leader to keep the structure of the session. One of the things that we're most focused on is feeling of safety. And this goes to this goes, this is whether you're in an office and it's your office and you're the boss of your office, you created the space, or whether it's in a family home where you you're actually going to their house, but you're still anytime you're with the family, it's your session. And you are going to be a monitor of the safety and you're going to structure the session. And I'll tell you how. So that what does that mean? It kind of means that we have to like we have to interrupt the parent sometimes. We have to separate the parent and child. We have to say we're not doing this now. We're doing this now. There's a way in which we're shepherding or being the caravan leader. Otherwise, the parent and child will do what they always do. They'll create chaos. There will be arguments. Some one of them will drop off and be hopeless and walk away, rolling their eyes and uh, you know those kind of things that they don't feel safe. So there's a lot of management. Okay. Another aspect of the IFT therapist is you're going to have to be active in facilitating play and connection and providing caregiving which means that you can't be removed or objective or stoic or professional, uh, clinical and sort of an analyzing presence in that kind of more distant um, persona of therapists. It's really being silly. It is using touch. It is evoking moments of surprise and and laughter okay so that means that you're bringing in an energy your whole use of yourself and i'll show you some of some aspects of that because our when we talk about our use of self what i'm talking about is what steve porges of the polyvagal theory has called social engagement system that way we use our body, our face, and our tone of voice to make the people with us feel like they can trust us, like we're safe, and that they want to connect with us. So the IAFT therapist, you're going to be embodying these attributes. Let's talk about the social engagement system. So everybody knows that the way you are in terms of your voice tone, your gestures, your facial expressions, the way you move, the way you breathe even, we know that that communicates so much more than what we say. And Borges in the polyvagal theory broke down some of these elements of our nonverbal communications that are most impactful on the other person to make them feel trusting, to make them feel safe, to make them want to connect with you. This is super important for babies, but it's important for all, all people, especially anybody who's mistrusting. So what are these elements? They are first what is called voice I really want you to come become very familiar with voice prosody. The word prosody, you may or may not have heard that word before. I want you to go ahead and say it. Voice 
prosody. And what that means is, is using a prosodic voice is a voice that has a storytelling or a melodic feature to it that expresses energy, joy, pleasure. It gives a sense of content and meaning that is transmitted through the rhythm, through the tone of voice, through the pitch changes. So there are different vocalizations that sound like, you know, uh, kind of like music or storytelling. I can guarantee you that the person who you know in your life who's a good storyteller has really good pro voice prosody and they don't talk in a melodic voice and they don't go on and on and run in sentences without having any pitch changes. So one of the things that's really interesting about voice prosody is a child, especially a child, but all people, needs to have breaks in what they hear in order to process the information. And so when you have rhythmic packets of information and they're short, the child understands you better. And then by understanding you better, they at least they feel like I understand what this person is asking me. I may not agree with it, but I feel relieved that I understand. Kids who are anxious, they don't understand just because of their anxiety, but especially if you talk in a monotone voice with too many words, run on sentences, all no-nos. So let me give you an example. If I speak, in rhythmic packets, it's like this. First, we're going to go pick up your brother. Then we're going to go to grandma's house. And then we're going to go to the ice cream store. Okay. So you heard three packets of information. Da 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 Okay. And so the child understands the sequence. And they feel at least calmed that they're not uh, going to be caught off guard by not understanding what the directions were. Again, they might not like it, but they feel good or anchored that they understand. Now, what we know is that it's not just voice prosody. You can see by my face. And by the way, for those of you who are able to adjust your screen, it's better to make my video, my face bigger and the slides at least half the size of your screen because a lot of what I'm gonna be doing has to do with facial expressions and tone of voice. And so, uh, your, and gestures. And so let me even make sure that you can see my torso. The idea of is using your hands to punctuate also helps okay because my voice is congruent with congruent with my face and my hands and the rhythm of my hands helps to make everything understood and coherent and this really helps a child again to feel like i this person is trustworthy so gestures posture uh i also if we're look. We're talking about eye contact, meaningful eye contact. You can look at somebody in a focused way, not to stare, not for a long time, but when you do look at them. One of the um, the the wonderful tricks that I learned is to when you look at somebody, look at their look at from your left eyeball to their left eyeball and focus on it. Imagine that there's a flame behind their eye, their pupil, and that's their soul. And you can really see inside their soul. Do you know, Shakespeare, I believe, said that the eyes are the window to the soul. So when you're looking at somebody, with when you want to evoke a feeling of compassion and a gaze, which is a look, but more than a look, because it's a loving look, okay? That is a, the idea is, just focus on their eye for a short bit. And then you can, of course, avert your eye uh, contact. And some people will ask, well, what if there are many people who are not comfortable with eye contact because they're, they're neurodivergent or it's overstimulating or trauma? Well, then don't. 
I mean, if people are averting their eye, then don't look, you don't, you're not going to stare at them. I'm evoking this to, um, especially there's a, a, a use, a purposeful use of evoking a gaze when somebody's mad at you or they, they feel that you're hostile with them and you feel yourself becoming shut down and losing, losing touch with the client's humanity. You know how we sometimes feel like, wow, I am becoming, I feel like a robot. I want to get out of this room. I don't like this person. That's when it's especially helpful to do that image of looking behind the person's eye and imagining that you can see a flame, which is their soul. And then it, it, it literally neutralizes the sense of like, this is my enemy who's attacking me. That person then looks at you and notices that and they soften. It's reciprocal. We also have occasions where it's appropriate to touch. Not all the time, but especially with kids. And I'll tell you this, there are uh, many times where I've touched adult clients. It could be something as simple as shaking their hand with both of your hands cupped around their hand to say, really, really important for me to meet you. I am so grateful that you came. Uh, I find ways possibly to touch depending on the situation. I might touch a parent's shoulder on the way out or but even providing things like um, a pillow if they're uncomfortable and they need to adjust their arm or their leg or giving them a footstool or giving them a cover or blanket and giving them a warm cup of tea. So those sensory things. But with children, we do encourage the parent to touch and we will I and encourage clients to find activities that provide touch. And you will certainly see those in some of these examples that are going to be coming up. So I'm going to take a sip of my coffee and I, I encourage all of you to do the same. Let's move on because I want to, what I, I think in this short program, so two and a half hours, two hours and, and 45 minutes, that's not enough time to cover everything that all the aspects in depth of IAFT. I have chosen to focus on the dyadic part, which is when you've done your parent work, the first state of phase of working with a parent alone, and then the dyadic phase where you're doing two to three parent and child sessions, and then every fourth session is a parent session only. I wanted to break that down for you so you can really imagine it. So what is the structure? I said we have to be structured. Well, here is a proposed plan for you. This is very flexible, but I, I think everybody likes to have a plan so that they feel prepared. And what I'm saying is this. Let's say you have about 50 to 60 minutes in a session. Maybe you have 45. Uh, consider that you could do in have three parts to a session, parent-child session. And then two out of the three parts are comprised of play activities. And the play activities are focused on play, like playfulness, having fun, and relaxation. And only one third is what we call, what I call a deliberate dialogue, which is a conversation about something that some something good maybe and something stressful but for a limited amount of time and in a structured way so that it's successful and it is not stressful and doesn't repeat the negative cycles that happen at home like dysregulation and blow-ups and arguments and and desperation and hopelessness so two-thirds plan relaxation one-third deliberate dialogue 
you can do it like this, a third of the, so we're talking about 15 minutes play and relaxation. Okay, 15 minutes deliberate dialogue, 15 minutes plan relaxation at the end. This is not a hard and fast script or rule. You can completely change it, the, the ratios around. I have had children who they came in and they were not going to talk at all. And we didn't even talk for two minutes. The deliberate dialogue lasted two minutes. I've had kids who I thought we were going to play for two thirds of the time and they were ready to uh, really get into a conversation and really have a deep, deep dialogue with their parents. I am I'm proposing, though, that it it helps to have a plan because it makes you feel more secure as a therapist. And I think that's really, really important. That's that's what I found is having a plan is great and then you can modify it. So I said that if two thirds of the, the session is play and relaxation, that means we have to have quite a few activities, right? Okay, so what do I mean by play and relaxation? I think it, what's different about this approach, this approach in the play aspect is really based on TheraPlay, which I mentioned is the model that I'm, I was trained in for all these years and in TheraPlay. And this, in fact, here in this picture is none other than the wonderful Phyllis Booth, who is giving an airplane ride to my daughter when she was little. Um, and at this point, uh, Phyllis was, I think, um, I think she was 86, uh, something along those lines. <laughs> and Phyllis can still, she can still do this um, at almost 98. She can still do this um, with a child that size. I'm confident that she still, she can still do this. And Phyllis Booth is, is, the, is the developer of TheraPlay. Um, from TheraPlay, I learned the value of these play and relaxation activities that create an environment that is so relaxing and pleasurable. It really brings the defenses down. It makes children eager to come. It helps to really facilitate the, the conversation part, the dialogue, which might be about difficult subjects. Okay. So let's just say that the play activities that I'm thinking of are not, they're not board games and they're not games that have a, a set of really highly uh, evolved rules. They're more face-to-face -face interactions and fun interactions that rely mostly on just you and me. Like I, I am the funnest object here. Like in this video, in this, um, uh, picture, you see Phyllis doesn't have any objects. She doesn't have puppets or Legos or dollhouses. Now, I'm not saying that that isn't useful material, but I'm looking for engaging activities that are interactive and that they don't focus on the, uh, the rules or on competition. Okay. We want to keep the focus on regulation. And so the therapist is going to be the one who, if it gets, if the child will maybe accidentally kick or throw the ball when it's before it's time, or maybe the balloon falls on the ground and they're disappointed. And of course, these kids have regulation issues. So the big, the big, uh, source of, of the therapeutic value is not only the connection and the joy of the surprises and the fun. It's also that if something goes wrong, the therapist helps to regulate by saying, because of course the child is upset, they might roll away, they might start to um, kick or pout, they don't want to play anymore, things that happen at home. Or the parent might say, come on now, it's not your turn. Or, hey, you did that too hard. The kinds of things that are happening at home, you would want to focus on 
making it regulated and positive. So you would say, oh, that's okay. I think he might have been surprised or disappointed that it didn't turn out the way uh, that he, he wanted it to. And that's okay. This is just for fun. And mom, we're going to give him another chance. So the therapist's response to the disappointments or the dysregulation in the child or the parent needs to be handled by the therapist so that it is channeled to make it uh, the focus to be on repair and to on reconnection. I'm going to just show you some activities that you've come here with some real need to know what can I do in a session? Well, here are some activities. I provided some of these pictures that you can have an idea. I have an activity that you can do uh, for out energy, and it's called the shapes. You stand up, and you're the leader, and the parent and the child are facing you. And you say, "This is just this is a standing up game," but I'm going to show you. I'm going to do it with my with just sitting down here. I got the shakes in my hands, and I don't know what they're doing. But I don't know where they're going next. What is this? Let me see. What they're going? They're moving. They're moving to moving to my elbow. Shakes in my elbows, and I don't know what they're doing. I don't know where they're going next. What's happening? They're moving to my arms. I got the shakes in my arms. I don't know what they're doing. Everybody can do this with me if you want to. I don't know where they're going next. I'm imagining people all over the world. What's happening? They're moving to my leg. You can't see my leg, but I'm going to make. I got the shakes in my leg. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't. Know. Let's put it back. Let's put the shakes back in our, our wrists. Got the shakes in my my. Get rid of these. I think that on the count of three, we're going to throw them up in the air and then see if we can get rid of these. One, two, three, jump. Um. Let's check. Do I have any more shakes? I don't. I don't have any more shakes, do you? If you do. We're going to do it again. Okay. So you might think some of these activities, they may be for younger children only, like under seven. And I hear you that once, it, once the child is, who's maybe a little bit older, like nine, 10, 11, is able to say, these are stupid games. And if you can respond with, with just rolling with it and saying, my boss pays me a lot of money to be stupid and it's okay. Uh, just to kind of let that humor and let it, let, let, let them sort of protest a little bit because they're wanting to protect their dignity. But after a while, they want to join in. And you could also say, you know what, we could so okay to do, to be stupid in here. We, we because we don't do it outside okay so don't worry if they want to answer that way then sometimes that alleviates the children's worry that they're going to be teased or something okay so just keep that in mind that these activities they actually work with children who are older and then i'm i'm thinking after maybe age 12 13 to modify them somewhat, but we can still have some ideas um, and um, just the, the, the gestalt of it, the idea of having playful activities and relaxing things for all kids is what I want you to take away. Let me show you an activity called Balloon Between Two Bodies. This is a video. Um, I have the permission to show several videos from um, from families, um, and I would um, request that those of you who are watching, just to respect and say and to honor uh, the fact that the uh, the people in these videos have 
made a decision to show the um, the work because they're wanting to help. Okay, so I'm really really grateful for the um, cooperation of of some of these families. Let me show you balloon between two bodies. Wow. <laughs> nice job, Nora. Okay. Now here's a here's a funny game to play with. You stand side to side, so you guys are almost shoulder to shoulder. Put the balloon between your shoulders. Put the balloon right between your shoulders. Oh, thank you, sweetie. Okay. Now see if you can keep the balloon between your shoulders. Walk across them without dropping it. So walk. Like, Anyway, okay. Get the balloons to where you like it. There you go. And start walking. <gasps> Look at that. Quite a lot of coordination between you two. Your face. <laughs> okay, Keep nice. going. Keep, okay, now you're going the other way. Okay, okay. good. Okay, now pause. Now take the bullet between your back, so you're back to back. Okay. Now decide if you want, you can hold hands so that you can know which way you're going. And you can decide which who's leading, and you can walk a certain way, walk forwards, walk backwards. I walk forwards. Okay. <laughs> Very nice, you. I have an idea. Wow. Ah, ah! Wow! It's working! You're going around and around. That's so, so good. good. Oh. It's, it's working. Wow. No, you're doing an especially good job. Okay, now I'll take the balloon and put it forehead to forehead. What? It's stuck to Heather's head. Forehead to forehead? Oh, good idea. Okay. <laughs> you guys are so coordinated together. Okay, let's go down. Ah! Whoa! <gasps> You're going to go back up too? Yeah, we did it. Oh, I love it. <laughs> okay. Good job. Wow. That is really Hey. So I hope that you saw that my job was to be really encouraging of them and also direct them what the next step step would be and uh, let them know that they're a really good team. I did this online. They couldn't come to my office on that day, but we still were able to have a session. And I facilitated that through the screen. They happen to have a balloon, but I think that, that 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 really shows the ability of the, the interactive part of the of, of of just having these activities, these ideas, really just puts people in a lighter mood. Uh, it has to do with just the connection and the movement. Okay. Okay. Here's another activity: giving just just ideas. Activity is called slippery slip, and you have the directions written here. You take lotion, you put it on the child. So this is a could be a, a with their child. You can demonstrate this on the parent or on the child yourself. I would suggest practice this first at home with a partner or an own child, or maybe with somebody at work, a colleague. Then you take the the lotion and the the child arms and then you pretend that you're slipping away and you go I'm slipping away oh no I'm trying to hold on and then you fall back and it's very funny it has a very strong element of like of peekaboo when the when an infant and a parent there's that moment of uh oh you're gone you're back it's a moment of surprise 
And then you can have the child pull you back up. It feels really nice from perspective of stretching. Also, uh, there's this really great sense of proprioceptive input, which is one of our senses of feeling our body, especially in our joints, which are stretched in our shoulder and our arm, our elbow. And that really helps to make a person feel calm. Another play activity, cotton ball war. So I love this activity and you can play this as you can see with more than one child. If let's say you are in a meeting, uh, maybe in a family home and you know, a kid, uh, the other child who is not the, your, your client wanders in, or maybe the parent had to bring their other child to your therapy session and they're waiting outside the door and you want to include line up a cotton ball the cotton balls on an imaginary line on the floor between you and the um the child so in the case of a parent and child uh coming to a dyadic session i would put the parent and child together on one side you're on the other side you line up the cotton balls on an imaginary line you count to three Everybody starts throwing, the parent and child throw the cotton balls on your side, you throw them on their side, and after 30 seconds or whenever you decide and the buzzer goes off, you shouldn't do it for longer than 60 seconds. It's tiring. You should let the parent, uh, whoever has the least cotton balls on their side is the winner. And it's really fun. It's very, there's something naughty about, you know, throwing things so in but it's just for fun and it doesn't hurt you can play it three times if you're playing it between a parent and a child at home or something like that then remind the parent the goal is for connect it isn't about cheating so if the child then throwing the cotton balls after the buzzer goes off avoid saying oh you're cheating um, if anything, if that happens in the session, you would say, oh, it's so exciting. It's so exciting. And that's why you want to throw, you want to keep throwing more. It's okay. It's all right. Um, the signal to the parent is let's get off this point of you're cheating. You're not listening. That takes a very much a moralistic approach. And in our my perspective from attachment theory it isn't a moral approach it isn't a moral reason there isn't uh uh the child isn't doing it just so like he can see what he can get away with or because he's a sore loser there's a need that he feels underneath the need is somehow i'm so overexcited or I'm getting super swept away or i feel panicked that i'm not going to be um uh successful and maybe um, I won't be favored or I'll be excluded. And so we want to respond from that level. And that's the level we have to model it. So a parent might say, oh, you're cheat, you're cheating. I would then turn right to the parent and say, mom, I think he's really excited or I think it might actually be stressful, even though it seems like it's just a silly activity and it's really okay. So people feel, uh, clinicians do feel quite stressed when they have to reframe activities or responses from, from the child right in front of the child within a session. And however, that's part of the therapy. If the parent scoffs and says, no, that's, you know, that's not how it works in real life. You would say, okay, got it. I respect that. Would it be okay if just in here we did, you know, we we looked at it from a regulation perspective or from wanting to feel connected and feel fearing that that they're feeling excluded? Um, if the parent says no, I can't I can't allow that because if you do that in here, he's going to do it outside and he's going to get in trouble, and I'm not having him. He can't afford to get in trouble. Okay, okay, I got you. 
Thank you for telling me about that. And I really want to hear more about that. So let's talk about it in our next parent session. Okay. I want to then hear it out, hear out the parent. They may have a very strong reason. Often it's an issue of safety. It's a cultural reason. It's a reason of um, that they might be dealing with uh, uh, racism or other um, societal factors that make it you have that my child has to be a rule follower or has to not get in trouble. So we have to respect that. But then I still want to talk to the parent. How can we find a way to make it so that it's less a focus on shame and moralizing? Because my fear is, is that makes the child then um, either go into a state of of shame himself, and then we can't connect with him. We can't teach him anything. You know, we have the same goal. We want him to learn and to, to connect, or, and we want to teach him good uh, uh, good behavior. But I'm trying to do it in a little different way. So how can I communicate with you in the session um, that would be acceptable to you? Okay. So these activities of play, they're very exciting, and they will bring up these aspects of of dysregulation that the therapist has to address. Okay, so this is just an ex an, a kind of another example of um, slippery slip uh, activity I showed you just a minute ago um, in pictures. Let me show you the video. At the game that you love behind you that um, is soft enough, so maybe could put a pillow or maybe you could use those yeah those yoga mats as long as they're soft in front of you and if you sit in front of him then you can do the lotion like like the slippery slip do you remember the game where you hold on to his arms and then you fall backwards so fold your legs um mom so you can get so that you might get close to you and then you might, you're gonna put um lotion on both of someone's arms <laughs> ah, there you go you know what you're doing <laughs> ah, it's funny that feels so good when somebody stretches you out like, like that <laughs> I'm now. okay and then you're gonna hold on but like, uh, like at his elbow or even above and you're gonna try on and you're gonna slip back you're gonna go <laughs> hold on try to hold on Fall backwards. Can you fall? Go. Can you go? Oh, where you go? Try and hold on. Slipping away. Try to hold on, and I slipped. Can you try to go like even slower, so like you, you're like making it more dramatic? I'm trying to hold on. I can't hold on. I'm trying, but I can't. Okay, plenty of activities that are ideas, and I am confident that you can think about how to just apply, just think of many activities that are like the ones that I showed you. So the spirit of them is what matters. It's not the specific activities. You can think of so many of them that are just focused on on pleasure and connection, and they don't have a specific goal or winner in mind, okay? Now, before I take questions, I want to go over relaxation activities. What are the relaxation activities? I believe that in a therapy session, there needs to be some element of nurturing and pampering and relaxation, and like where you have a little bit of a sense of, oh, just exhale for a minute. Isn't that refreshing? I, I, a lot of therapy uh, for kids, they think it's really stressful because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble. And the, when it's, when it's parent and child together, they often are afraid of that, uh, or that something's going to go wrong. There's going to be dysregulation or something like that. So think of creating moments of calm and caring. The idea is I want the child to feel like you can can calm you and make you feel soothed. And, and I want both the parent and the child to feel less stress. And a lot of that is 
you know, there's a lot of uh, element of touch that creates connection, but safe touch. So these are some of the activities uh, that I'm suggesting are um, there. The, here are some element. Here are some ideas. Uh, first of all, bring them something to drink and eat. It's not. It's not for nutrition. It's not a meal. It's also not a reward for good behavior. It's just ask them, what is your favorite snack, mom and child? And maybe we're talking about those little bags of, uh, you know, individual serving sizes of, of um, animal crackers or Cheetos or popcorn. And you just get one bag. You're not going to give them multiple bags and start having a whole smorgage board, okay? But eating and drinking is a very fundamental attachment activity. Also, sucking and swallowing, that's why I like a straw. That's one of the only things that infants can do to regulate themselves is to suck and swallow. So bringing in a drink like a juice box um, or any anything, even just water, but have a straw. Um, have elements to this. This is applies whether you have an office or if you're just bringing your bag and you're working if, in home. I have a bag of stuff, um, hand lotion, baby powder, band aids, things that you can do to make a person feel better if they have an owie, or if they have some bruise, or they have dry skin, or they need a little TLC. Okay. Also consider activities like uh, the. I'm going to show you some things that involve touch, like doing a weather report on their back, making a pizza and stacking uh, pillows on them and then pressing down or making a burrito, rolling them in a uh, blanket or doing a pretend car wash on their back. So you do need blankets and pillows. And when I've worked in homes, people took their bed pillows, they took the coach you know, that kind of thing. You can also do a nail polish and manicure with um, kids who are older. So teenagers, they really like that. And you would bring all the accoutrements, like you would bring a file and you would do the whole hand massage and really go all out. Aromatherapy fragrances and have them guess the scents or flavors. Teenagers love that. So the weather report is something I mentioned. What it is, is I can show you a video. It is a massage, but it's told in a story, responding movements. And the even children who are aversive to touch generally, they like it because it's part of a story. So it makes sense. The touch aspect makes sense in the context of the store of the activity. Let's watch. And touch the water. They make the water look like silver. You see it green all through the water. And that is the weather for our neighborhood. Can I get there? <laughs> so remember the the idea is you want to make a getting when you're doing this, first of all. I would not use light touch. I would use your thumb and your whole thing, like your whole hand, and just do it like this. The reason is it's less ticklish, and I don't want it to tickle. Some kids really like light touch. That's fine. But what I don't want you to do is be um, tickling the child like, oh, the rain, oh, the lightning. Okay, why? Because that's going to alert the child and they're going to start getting... This is a child who's already just like squealing and they're already like... <laughs> okay, so what are they going to do? They're going to roll off. They're going to start to kick. They're going to giggle in a high-pitched voice. This is meant to calm. Okay, each phase, like I say, the, the sun 
is out and it's a warm circle. I'm trying to make each movement last a while. When you change the movement every two seconds, it alerts the brain again. And I'm, I'm trying to make a more hypnotic effect. I don't also want to ask the child a bunch of questions. Is this good? What's coming next? Do you like the sun? Are you hoping for rain? Do you like you know, lightning? I don't want you to ask a lot of questions because this is an opportunity more for relaxation. And if you're going to show this on the parent or on the child, you do have to, you really have to guide the parent and explain to them like I'm explaining to you. Okay, another idea is the burrito roll. You put a blanket on the ground and then you have the child lay in the blanket um, vertically like that. Then the parent and um, you and the parent roll the child all the way until they become a wrap. It could be a burrito. It could be a crepe. Luckily, no matter where you're from, every country has this kind of food, a variation. And then you say, what do you like on your crepe? And when you do that, you're going to press down nice and firm. Okay, we're going to put some whipped cream and we're going to press it down and press it down and put it on. Okay, now notice the voice. It has everything to do with the rhythm and the touch. And that's what I'm talking about, the social engagement system. Okay. The um, the way you do it with the touch and the, vo the, the voice tone, that creates a calming effect. Oh, and then we're going to put strawberries. Okay, and we'll put those on. And we're going to press it down and press it down and press it down. Okay, so remember the relaxation activities have to do with how you're bringing the energy into a more relaxed, rhythmic, hypnotic state. And so that means you can't ask a lot of questions like, you know, that kind of, so just be aware. I'm saying that because I supervise a lot of therapists with video and they show their video. And I, uh, when we watch it, they notice that they're talking a lot and they're talking perhaps in a very beat voice that's high pitch. We want something more calming here. So you have to be aware of your own use of self. Another activity is a, you can make a sandwich or a pizza. So the child lays on the pillow and you say, okay, this is your, the special ingredient. And then we're going to put, what do you like on top of your pizza? You like cheese? And then you press that down. Okay, now you like mushrooms. So we're going to put another pillow. And then each time you do that, you're going to just press down. And of course, when you're doing that, um, that, that, that um, piling of uh, the, the heavy objects, they get to that proprioceptive input, which is that sensation of our joints being stimulated uh, in our body, and that calms us down. Of course, am I checking? Yes, I am checking that she likes it. You can see that she is relaxed. She is in that second, her, she's very relaxed and she's very receptive. She wanted more blankets on top. And then at the end, it, she was under there for a minute or two. And after we um, finished the entire pizza, and then I said, okay, now when I count to three, I'm going to see if you can jump out. And then I count one, two, three, and then she jumped out of the, uh, the whole pile. So you can see that these rely on touch through having an intermediary object of the blanket or pillow. So for those of you who are saying, I can't touch, this child is aversive to touch, he was sexually abused. There are ways to be able to, to, to get this relaxation and this nurturing in. Okay. Now, at this halfway point, I'm going to take, we're going to be able to take 10 minutes worth of questions before we take a 15 minute break. So then the second part, we'll talk about the deliberate dialogue and then working with parents.
Um, I'm hoping that my colleague can help me um, with the questions. Okay. So I'm going to read out some questions uh, from the chat. These are a selection. We can't and get to all of them, unfortunately. How is the therapist's own attachment history play a role in this therapeutic relationship? Uh, it does. And I'm so very grateful for the person who asked this question. Our attachment, this is, this is essentially a three-person job. We have the parent, the child, and the therapist. And the therapist's attachment history is really important. What I need to, every aspect of the work that I ask the parent to do, I have to do it myself. This is one of the basic premises of the book that I wrote about it, IAFT. I am oh, I'm very aware that a uh, particular sensitivity or need to act out my own attachment history on the, on the, on the client or the child. And so that's why I have to do my own work um, through going over my own attachment history, the questions for parent self-reflection. I've done that on myself. I also highly recommend uh, being in supervision and group supervision. This work really makes a person feel the same things that you felt when you were a child. I'll tell you what, when I have a parent and child and the child and the ther the, the, the parent is dismissing the child or, or rolling their eyes or something like that. It makes me feel like something that I saw when I was a child, whether I was the the victim or whether I was I was watching it helplessly. So that's just an example. Um, so without this parallel work, um, we're liable to really we'll get we'll get stuck. Um, somebody has asked about the considerations for remote therapy. It's, it is definitely okay to do this through a remote platform. You know, I was really surprised when the pandemic, uh, hit, I thought there's no way to do this, this work. I thought it was so crucial to be able to interact um in a face-to-face -face way how was how could you do that um idea about looking left people to left people when you don't know where you're looking on the camera you know well it turns out this work and, and i i was really surprised that um you just have to be very very um demonstrative. So I would just be here with my own pillows and I with my own balloon. Uh you know, so I just I had to just as much as possible, be really, really animated. But now that COVID is subsided for now, um, a lot of people benefit from telehealth. And the idea is, you know, they are, they don't have transportation. They are all areas. They are deployed in, in the military. And so I really, I think you can take these, I've been able to successfully take these principles Yes, with modifications and and make them work for people who can't come physically. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a good question about what are the cross cultural implications of the social engagement system, and how do we know these nonverbals communicate safety for most, if not all, individuals? So the idea of having um, the, the communications are universal. Um, just by all of the research that's been done cross-culturally um, from all parts of the world in attachment theory. So it's a very basic tenet. However, I do say that one has to really, really be careful of judging another culture uh to say that their attachment is not um uh you know that their their babies can't be securely attached something like that uh 
there are cultures in which the baby is um, held on the back and strapped to the parent. There are cult as an infant. There are cultures in which there are five or seven caregivers, and it isn't like one or two primary caregivers the way we think of it in our uh, sort of Eurocentric um, configuration. Um, and so the but but the quality of um, the physiologic aspects like being held, being shushed, being rocked, the uh, being um, made to feel like you're not alone, having a voice tone that has different rhythms, that's also been found to be completely universal. Um, so in, in various scientific studies. Now, the difference is that I can't judge the 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 quality of the voice tone of somebody um, who is different from me in a, from a different culture because their the range of their voice tone or the quality of their voice tone or the rhythm is going to be different and so I have to be very very careful and ask the parent what does this mean for you and be open minded and try to really put myself in their shoes and see how to respond. Um, I'm going to take a few more questions. So somebody wrote, I'm noticing the children seem to be lacking the attention span for non-technology related activities. Yeah. Well, um, I have found that kids, if you have a strong social engagement system and you bring, you offer activities that are, uh, you know, vigorous and playful and involve movement, the kids are drawn to them. So in a way, it's a, the antidote is to be able to play these more, these these really active games, the, the very uh, lively activities. I do understand, though, that there is a situation perhaps in which like a child insists on bringing their phone into therapy. And then we have a power struggle. It's really, really hard when that happens. And I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to give a blanket recommendation for that because I found it's been very, very specific and very personal. So not always will I insist that a child put away their phone. A lot of children, you know, who are feel a lot of shame, feel a lot of disconnection, they hide behind their phone for a very good reason. And part of it is because they feel a lot of shame. And they feel a lot of judgment. Um, they don't feel safe, and so I'm going to work with that. I'm going to. Um, I'm not. I'm going to try to engage with them while they have their phone in their hand, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So I have a question that I can't really answer for. Well, I can only answer was very specific to you know my state and my billing. But somebody's asking, how do you bill for parent only sessions? I do it as I take the families, the parents' insurance, insurance, and I bill under their insurance, their name. I want this to feel like they have skin in the game, and that this is this is about them as well. Um, but you're asking, would you bill for family without patient present? So that's just in the in the US. We have a lot of people from all over the world here. Here's my message. You in cooperation with whoever is your supervisor or whoever is the director or whoever you can sort of put your heads together and think what would make it so that the payer is not telling me who I can meet with and who I can't meet with. I know you know, if your if your conviction is, I have to be able to see the parent and child together, and then I have to be able to see the parent by herself because she is the most important agent of change for this child's relationship with the world. And if that's our guiding focus, then we have to talk to the payers and be absolutely adamant that this is cutting edge. This is the healthiest thing for children, and I really, really try to influence the. Okay. Um, hey, I'm going to 
going to take one more question. Do you have any thoughts on ways to manage a child that is resistant to participating in these sessions and showing anger towards therapists? So when I am when I am hearing these sessions, are you saying, I'm assuming you're saying the parent and child session together? So I really hope that you will be able to see the uh in this next part, I'm going to be showing how to help a child who feels that they are being misunderstood, they're being attacked, they don't feel safe, they feel like everybody's against them. Um, if if we're doing this in a safe way, then part of what should happen is the child should feel that they're accepted no matter what. And so if the child is angry, I would say, you know, it's okay for you to be angry. And I appreciate you showing me what's on your mind. And, um, you know, we will, um, we can still find ways to, you know, share a snack together or um, play balloon bop together. Something that shows the child, even though you're having a really hard time. I still like you. I'm still connected with you. And I, I see you in a positive light. Okay, friends. My idea is, is that in, it's about, it's 23 minutes after the hour in Chicago. It's 2.23. And I am inviting you all to take a brief break of 15 minutes and we will be back. Um, well, we basically 15 minutes from now. Okay. It's the, um, 38 minutes after the hour. Wow. I can't believe I did the math right. Okay. Have a good break and I will see you shortly.
Okay, I'm hoping that right on the second half of our workshop. So we left off with seeing activities from play and relaxation, right? I suggested that possibly two thirds of your session with a parent and child be activities that are fun or relaxing and that the therapist needs to keep focus on the safety and on the regulation and help the parent and the child in case of that rupture where the child is disappointed or the parent is being critical of the child. Now we have the one third of, and I'm saying that lightly because I think that the, the, the dialogue part could be longer, it could be shorter, but it also could be longer. The deliberate dialogue part is what I want to talk to you about now. This idea came from Dan Hughes's model, dyadic developmental psychotherapy. I'm a trainer and consultant in dyadic developmental psychotherapy, DDP. And it forms one of the most uh, influential bases of my work. What is the deliberate dialogue? Uh, it is an opportunity for the parent and child to, to just to practice experience, practice having a regulated and constructive conversation about a stressful topic. to solve a problem. It is not meant to change a behavior. I want you to know something really universal about dyads, not just parent and child dyads, but friends, uh, best friends or spouses, okay? Really close dyads. There's a lot of things on which we disagree. Many of the things upon which we disagree feel fundamental to us as a human being. The fact that the other person doesn't agree with us can feel really hurtful and distancing. That is a true fact of life. That's not going to change, and you're not, not going to come to some sort of resolution on a majority of the things that you disagree about. The thing that we hope for is to understand each other. And to feel like the other person hears us and understands our point. judging us is not saying, wow, if that's how you feel, you're disgusting to me. I can do you. You are not my preferred partner or child or whatever the, um, you know, relationship is. And that's the same in this model. What I'm looking for is for a parent and child to be able to talk about hard subjects, sometimes things that they really disagree on, and still it feel like they're not being judged or shunned or ostracized or that there's a huge rupture. And that's the goal of a deliberate dialogue. Unfortunately, in our society, most families, we have no model for this. We don't have a model for it. We, have, we come from places, from families where difficult topics and anger or sadness or disappointment or resentment or uh, jealousy is avoided. If you feel that way, then you're sent to your room and you're told that you should come back when you're um, fun to be around. And that's how we learn to deal with difficult subjects. Or if we are... Uh, maybe upset or jealous or something, we get a lecture. We might get uh, we might get teased. We see our uh, appearance as models, and a lot of times they're not able to talk about their disappointments or their disagreements. That may be a very scary thing to do. So being able to have an opportunity to talk about difficult things in a regulated way is the goal. 
who who needs to model this? Well, the parent needs to show the child how to do this, but they don't know how to. So we have to help the parent to show how the child how to how to to show the child how to do this, that it's okay, that we can that we can um, have a difficult conversation and survive it with our connection intact. Okay. So here's what is something that we're on the look for. We're we're on the lookout. We as the therapists, we have to be structured and organized and we have to be in command. We have to be the ones in charge of this conversation because parents are going to use lectures, monologues, explanations. They're going to go on tangents about why they do what they do. Well, I I have no choice. I have to get you, you know, I had to get you, um, uh, um, like I had to yell at you and we have to get out in time because if we're not, uh, uh, we don't get to school on time. And you're going to get another detention. And then after that, you're going to get expelled. And we can't have that. So that's that's what I call an explanation, a long explanation or a lecture. Okay. And a rationale. So the things that the parents say, well, I have to give your brother more attention because he's younger than you. And he also has special needs. And when you were yet, you know, that's rationales. Okay. Kitchen sinking, the kind of behaviors that like parents or children will do. You know, I would be fine with giving you your phone if you would be willing to just do your chores and clean your room. And I also, I told you not to take um, your skateboard out and you did it anyway. And this reminds me of when you were, you know, um, out on your bike, that's kitchen sinking. So we are the ones who are monitoring the flow of the conversation because we have to say to the parent and the child hey hold on a minute hold on i gotta slow you down here i got it can we take a pause can we take a break so here is where you as the therapist is going you're going to be using your social engagement system i really want you to focus on my body and what i'm saying here and when i'm using my um my own you know gestures i need to sit up straight I need to be really in between these people. So I don't want to be sitting far away. I want to be sitting close enough to be able to almost get in the, in the middle of them. I want to be able to use hand gestures. Hey, hold on, hold on. Hold. Hey, hey, wait a minute, mom. That's the thing I'm saying. If you let a parent run with it or a child run with it, you know, different uh Children can be like accusing the parent. You never buy me anything. You always give him everything that he wants. And oh, hold on a second. Hey, wait a minute. I got to slow you down here. I got, we got to take a break here. So I want to make use of my hands, use of my voice, because these kinds of dynamics, you're going to, uh, you're going to want to catch them uh, really quickly. As soon as you can notice. And of course you need the courage. You need to be able to, uh, have experience. You might be frightened of doing that, but that's that's the learning, and that's why, uh, you know, I do run group supervisions. We do, do practice this. Thing is not an easy thing, especially if you were told taught not to interrupt when you were a child. Um, when when we're listening for a something that the the child is saying we have to help the child express what is underneath so if they're saying something like um something superficial like you know um i took his iphone because you didn't um you never give me anything so i have to take his i had to take his iphone i had to you know, i had to text my friend and i had no choice to do it because you didn't get me you didn't get me my own phone okay so that's the superficial thing that's going on. What is he really saying underneath? He's feeling left out. He's feeling disconnected. That's what we have to help him. So I'm not going to stick with the superficial behavior. I'm going to try to see what's underneath the behavior and help the child. As a therapist, I'm going to help the, the child to express that. And then I'm going to help the parent. Before they say anything else, I'm going to help them by guiding them to say statements of acceptance and empathy. That's something that I teach parents. I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to teach you that um, coming up. That is the, 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 the overall goal of the deliberate dialogue. Okay. 
So now let me go ahead and steps in the deliberate dialogue. Here are the steps. The first thing is, I recommend that you ask the parent to email you or text you something good that happened that week and something stressful that happened that week. If you are working with a child who absolutely does not want you to talk to the parent ahead of time and feels resentful when the parent is texting you um, and sort of setting the agenda by saying a good thing and a stressful thing, then don't. If the parent, if the child is offended by that, don't. If the parent can't do it because they can't be organized enough, okay, then then they then you in the session when they first come in, I want you to train the the parent and the child that you're the one who's going to ask, hey, what is a fun thing that happened? What's a happy thing that happened? What's a um a quirky thing that happened, anything that is sort of more towards the uh, positive or um, just interesting. So it's supposed to be something that isn't stressful to talk about and chat with them about that. Talk with them about it in a prosodic voice. Prosodic voice, if you remember, is the melodic tone. You show interest, you give, you know, give a lot of that, that rhythmic affirmation, like, oh wow, that's a minute. Wait a minute. Really? That's so cool. You played a tennis game and a soccer match in the same day? My gosh. Were your legs just so exhausted or your arms or wow? So, you know, really join in with. The, the thing that they bring up um, that's positive. And then ask them about something stressful. Now notice I'm not, it's not something that's uh, bad that the child did. Okay, you could say something stressful, something yucky. I want you to be cautious that parents often will bring up an event like, yeah, you know, Tommy, he, um, he, you know, accidentally knocked down his sister's tower, but I know, you know, it didn't seem like he was doing it. He seems like he was doing it on purpose. So I think you can, you can hear the tone of judgment. So if your parent says that you would say, okay, thanks for, okay. Thanks for letting me know that. Let's start with that. But what I'm trying to tell you here is don't let the parent go on and on because they're going to say, um, he does that a lot. You know, he um, seems like he's really like cooperative with his sister, but then he'll go and knock it and knock her tower down and they get into an argument blah, blah, blah. way too much information. So do you understand if the parent is bringing up something stressful, just make sure that they're not bringing in too much content because what's going to happen with the kid. You'll see the kid. They'll start running around. They'll disconnect. That's not safe. They don't feel safe when Aaron is telling a lot of things that are negative. So we have to really you just um, keep to to a, a sort of um, a very circumscribed amount of information, and then we use the pace uh, spiral to uncover the deeper issue underneath. Which I'll show you. Um, we are going to use guessing and wondering to discover what the deeper meaning is with the child. I'm going to do that as the therapist. Then I'm going to ask the child to tell the parent how they feel about once we discover what the deeper, more underlying motivation, what's what's their deeper wish or motivation or belief. And I'm going to guide the parent, uh, the child, excuse me, to say, sometimes I feel like or sometimes I worry that. I don't want children to speak in categorical terms, just like I don't want parents to do that. So I'm going to teach them to say, sometimes I worry that. Um, you you prefer my brother over me because you spend more time with him and I know he's young but um and that he has special needs but I feel like I'm less important then we're gonna have um if if the child can't talk for themselves because they're feeling too anxious they're feeling too sad they're feeling overwhelmed I will talk for them as though I am the child so I'll say is it okay? For, is it okay if I speak as though I'm you and I'll tell your mom? Would you like me to do to tell it, uh, your mom for you? 
It's, it's a really interesting technique. It comes from, you know, psychodrama and it really is very effective. Children get used to it and they're very happy for you, for the therapist to talk as them because it really models to them how to, how to talk in, in a way that is still connected. Um, sometimes I feel like, you know, when you um, let uh, my brother play on his um, laptop or on his iPhone, and I don't get to, I feel like there's, it, it's unfair. It makes me think, wait a minute, does she even see me? It's just not, does she not even prefer me? Like, why is she letting him of all this stuff that I don't have? So do you hear that the way you're saying it, I'm speaking for the child, I'm putting a lot of affect in, I'm making it really um, emotive, but I'm not accusing, I'm not saying, you like him better than me and you give him stuff and I'm mad at you. And then guide the parent to say an accepting statement, an empathic statement. Okay. So when you do that, you're going to help the parent to say, hey, an accepting statement. Hey, thanks for letting me know what's on your mind. Really appreciate that. That makes sense that you would feel that way. And then an empathic statement. Yeah, I can really see how you feel if you know, since your brother gets to play more on technology than you do, and and he gets a lot more attention, you could really see how you would feel um, sad and sometimes left out. Maybe you're questioning if you're as important um, uh, to me as your brother is. Thank you so much for, for letting me know that. So that's the kind of, that you would ask the parent to say that, and you, um, we prepare parents. So that was referring back to that initial stage of um, the phase one, that PACE handout. Um, the PACE handout for parents is in the IAFT book. Um, and uh, we exercise, we, we, we um, do a role play on that in the first phase. So uh, they, in the moment, they sometimes don't remember what an accepting and empathic thing is. And we have to remind them by saying, hey, mom, can you say something accepting like, Hey, thanks for letting me know what's on your mind. Can you say something like that? Okay. At the end, a short problem solving, five minutes max. I'm not looking for um, a parent to be to say, "Hey, can you use your um, mindfulness skills next time? What should you what should you do next time? Shouldn't you come to me and ask for help um, or ask an adult for help?" That is a lot of lecturing. I don't want that brainstorming is like, hey, you're smart and I'm smart. Mom's smart. What can we do? How would this be more? How could this be better? And mom might say, well, I could, um, I think it's important to, to, to tell you, you know, to tell your son, like, I really, really, I really, really care about how you feel and if you feel lonely in your room and you feel like you're being um you know that you're being left out and you don't get to do as much fun stuff that's really important for me and maybe i'm gonna we're gonna find some time to do some some things just you and me okay if this is the problem solving part is not a time for the parent for the child to petition the parent and say well then you should get me my iphone if you say you agree with me then you should get me my iphone then as the therapist, you say, hold on a second. Wait a minute, kid. Hold on. I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you. This isn't a, a, an opportunity for you to negotiate your mom changing her rules. Okay. She has her rules. And if she feels that it's necessary that, that she wants to reconsider them, that's a decision for her. And she's going to she's gonna think about that um, at home. But that's not something that we're going to ask for in here. And the kid might be disappointed about that. That's okay. Uh, it's really clear, um, important for me to clarify that just because a parent is accepting and empathic doesn't mean they're going to give in on the rules or not have a consequence. At the end, we return to the relax and play activity to end the session on a good note. And that's the, um, that's the sequence. Wow, so that was quite a mouthful. In a little while, I'm gonna show you an example on video and that was really gonna help bring this together. First, I need to tell you of a very core tenet of the deliberate dialogue, which is pace. And it comes from 
dyadic developmental psychotherapy. Um, and the creator of that is Dr. Daniel Hughes. And the idea of the PACE attitude is playful, accepting, curious, and empathic. It's a way of being with another person that facilitates connection and understanding and reduces shame and reduces defensiveness. It really, really helps to also just to make people feel more comfortable and cooperative. And it's delightful that it spells pace because it's pacing is like rhythm and rhythm and pacing. That's a really important part of your social engagement system. So playful, accepting, curious, and empathic. Okay. Well, playful, I think we covered that. Um, being playful, you know, I made a little joke before if a kid said, this is stupid. And you say, well, my boss pays me a lot of money to be stupid. You know, that's um, making like little humorous jokes at your expense or being silly. Accepting is, and I have some some more detail um, about this. Accepting is just being unconditionally accepting of their under, under wishes or motives or feelings feelings without trying to convince them that uh, they should feel differently. Okay. Um, I had a dad who his daughter would come home and say, nobody likes me. Nobody wanted to play with me on the playground. And he would say, yes, you do, honey. You have, you have, you have friends. People like you there. You had friends over this weekend. You have friends. And she would argue with him. So I just said, just, just accept Say, Wow. Thanks for telling me that's what happened to you. It's really important for me to know what your what's on your mind. Okay, curiosity is just if if there's if there's a need to ask any questions, there the curiosity is not meant to be. Well, what did you do to make this the kid you know um, not want to play with you? Or, well, did you go up to anybody and ask them if they wanted to join your game? That's not curiosity. That's more of an interrogation. Curiosity is really non-judgmental. It's not evaluative. It's just wondering, hey, I wonder what that was like for you. I wonder what it was like for you when you were sitting on the playground and you were wanting to play with other kids and you didn't have you didn't have anybody to play with. And empathy, well, empathy is really just, it's literally the main currency of therapy. Right. But in therapy, um, Sometimes we do empathy sort of more clinically, like I can see that makes me really frustrated. But I want empathy to come from the heart, be like, oh, wow, that would be so lonely. Or that, you know, for a teenager, you would say, God, that sucks. So you're really uh, kind of letting your guard down and not being like a therapist, but really showing that you that you're really putting yourself in their shoes. So I, I had mentioned the pace spiral, where what does that mean? I uh, came up with this idea of when a person is saying something superficial, that is maybe something that's like an excuse or it's annoying or it's something like, uh, or something that's supposed to like making you really full, feel like off-putting. Um, if you think of acceptance, empathy, and curiosity, as a mechanism that every time you do say something accepting, something empathic, and then ask one curiosity question, it gets you deeper to where uh, you want to go in terms of what is underneath that superficial behavior. I'll give you an example. I had a kid who is really, really struggling. She was really struggling. And uh, she, she has a very hard time in school. She feels very different than other kids. She is, at times, she feels really bullied. At other times, it's not clear if she's the bully, but she has a lot of problems. She has problems with regulation as well. And um, her parents, they can't, they have to supervise her. Um, and so they have... Sometimes they have to miss work and things like that. So she feels really down about herself and something happened in school where she got in trouble um, for mouthing off at a teacher. And then when she came to session, she just said, sometimes I wish I didn't exist. And her parents were wanting to say like, oh my gosh, you're breaking my heart. Um, her dad wanted to say, I said, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's see. 
what's what's going on here? And I said, wow, you know what? It's really important for us to know what's on your mind. Okay, so just accepting is where you start, acceptance. And then you say, you could say something empathic. Yeah, because look, some really crappy things have happened lately. And then you can say something, a curiosity question, like, um, you know, have you been feeling that way for a long time? Um, then the, the, you know, the, the, the girl, she kind of like shrugged her shoulders. She say, yeah, kind of like forever. And the parent, again, they wanted to be like, that's not true. Like we had such a good summer. You had so many good things. So wait a minute, mom, we have to wait. We have to see what's going on here. It's really okay. And you just accept it. Wow. Ever since you can remember forever, that's a long time. Does it kind of feel like, are you kind of feel like, it sounds like you're feeling pretty discouraged right now. Like if you, if you're feeling discouraged, that would make a lot of sense. And she was just like, yeah, I said, okay. All right. Wow. So that discouraged feeling, is that kind of what is making you feel a little bit like you wish you, you didn't exist? She said, yeah. I said, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for again, acceptance. Um, empathy again. You know, it's really tiring when you can when you feel this way um, for a really long time. It's like it's really hard to it's really hard to you know keep trying. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm wondering anyway. Like, what what do you think would even be better if you didn't exist? I don't tell me more about that. And you know what she said. My uh, my parents' life would be a lot better without me. And the parents were very upset. And they said, okay, okay, I got you. Let me say this. Okay, thanks for letting me know what's on your mind. So we can't have the parents' reactivity get in the way. As hard as that is, we have to hear her out. I'm not, I wanted to see, I'm not afraid of her, you know, people saying it's like suicidal ideation and we have to make an evaluate. Okay, there's time for that. But one of the things that I particularly was thinking was that she was pushing away her parents um, because there was something that she was really afraid of. And I don't want her parents to um, get startled and start the whole, you know, anxiety machine that they typically are responding with. I know you see that the playfulness is sprinkled throughout. You see playfulness. Well, unfortunately, there's very little room at times when the kid is like this. And talking in this about this subject matter to be playful. But if there's room to be playful, it has to be there and it has to be spontaneous. Okay. So I when I say that develop the underlying motive or feeling from going from superficial to more of a core issue through using the pace spiral, this is what I'm talking about. I hope that makes sense because what we got to is she said. Her parent, she feels like um, she's a burden to her parents. And we, I said, is it, is it okay now? You know, that makes sense. Do you want to say that to your, your mom and your dad? In this case, I had both parents in the room and that's, it was uh, a unique situation, but, and um she kind of shrugged her shoulders and said, well, you know, I can say it for you. And I said, mom, sometimes I feel, mom, dad, sometimes I feel like there's so much going on. And and, and I, I feel really crummy about it. I feel really bad about it. And it's too much. And I also worry that, you know, I'm, I, I feel like I, I, um, uh, I caused too much trouble. And the parent, it was really hard, but the parents, I helped them say, dad, you first is, Thanks for letting me know that. And, and he was able to do that. Thanks for letting me know what's on your It's really important. That would be super hard if that's how you feel. And I, and I'm, I'm really, really um, sympathetic to how um, much you're dealing with. So it's really important for me. And I, I'm really grateful for that. That is the acceptance and empathy. Now, if they want to ask a curiosity question, that's okay. 
but I'm what I'm focusing on is I want to do this pay spiral and, and ask the, the, the curiosity question. Um, I don't want, necessarily want the parents to bombard the child with a lot of questions. And so I want the parents to focus on acceptance and empathy. Okay. So um, I'm going to just kind of skip forward. I do um, feel like we've covered these slides. Um, and um, I want you to know that when we're making questions of curiosity, I'm not trying to um, assert that I know, like, uh, you know, do you feel this way because you're being bullied or because um, your friends are rejecting you? I'm just going to say it in a very curious tone, like, hey, I wonder if it's because of what happened in school, like things like bullying, you know, bullying or, or your friends rejecting you. So the tone is what matters here. And it has to be very affective. Okay. Affect means that you have emotion, you have vitality, you're speaking with your social engagement system. Trying to make sense together. It's really that inner subjectivity. You have to watch the child and see how they react. Okay, so I believe that these are slides that are um, we've already covered. Let me give you some tips about how to do the deliberate dialogue. It has to feel safe. Kids know that you're going to talk about things that were stressful. They are dreading it when they come in the door. They are like, no, somebody's going to, you know, it's, it, they're going to be either in fight or flight in sympathetic activation, and they're going to act silly or run around or run out your room or throw stuff. Or they're going to go into, you know, withdrawal and dissociation, dorsal, and they're going to check out and they're going to like be completely catatonic or dissociating into their phone or going, oh, no. I don't know, and put their hood over their eyes. Well, if that's the situation, we have to give them some amount of assurance that they're not going to be attacked or um, that they can protect themselves. This is very much from the physiologic um, point of view. Remember, I talked about that. Uh, this has to feel safe. So what are some things that can make a child feel safe, safe enough that they're able to talk about these hard subjects? Well, the number one thing is you're going to structure the conversation. Okay, we talked about that. But also, here are some other things. First of all, I would oftentimes I give them pillows or blankets or even create a tent or something like giving them a blanket to kind of cover themselves up with in case they don't want to look and listen at the same time. If they have to both look and listen, they feel really exposed. I love the idea of giving them an invisibility cloak. If, if a parent and child are sitting close together, but the parent and child are going to talk about something that one of them is angry or afraid, they might feel too threatened to talk about something that's that intense, negative. And so the child needs to have some separation, but they're they're also frightened. So I like to like be able to give them a teddy bear, give them a blanket to hide in, things like that. Give them something to drink with a straw because remember, suck and swallow is one of the only things that helps. There are some kids who would rather just kind of play and they will, um, we, they prefer to like play with their Legos or their Play-Doh or um, they're in the corner and they're pretending that they're not listening. There's some kids who are jumping around. Um, but my, in order to help a child to regulate and feel safe it one of the best mechanisms for me is sort of essentially training them that they're going to be able to hide and that once they're in their kind of invisibility cloak or in their tent they don't even have to respond they're not going to be asked questions and i'll show you how to do that um we don't interrogate the child we don't ask him um to say yes or no with words if they don't want to. 
Uh, we don't, okay. Um, Nonverbal confirmation, that's enough. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Foot, yes, like this with their foot. If it's the only thing that's sticking out, foot, no. Foot, I don't know, okay? Also, you can see when a shoulder shrug, that means it mean it doesn't necessarily mean I don't know. It also means I'm not sure. It also means when you offer them something like, do you want a drink to, to have? A shrug means um, I, I can't say yes because I don't want to see, I don't want to um, overtly show that I'm dependent or hopeful here. Okay, so that might mean like, I'm not sure. I can't commit. And every time a child says like this, you say, thanks for showing me you don't know, or you're not sure, or you're of two minds about that. Or maybe that means go ahead and try. Make it into a verbal com communication that shows I understand you. Okay. Sometimes a child will be looking away and then they'll like look at you and you know you're making sense. Or they'll shift their head. They'll look down. You can tell that they're tracking you. And you'll say, aha, uh -huh, yeah, I think you're thinking about that. Yeah. So you're accompanying them with your tone of voice and noticing. So here's a tent that our kid made. She had her blankets and I mean, and her teddy bears in there, and then she got in it, and then she closed it with, with a green pillow. That was the door. So make that possible for them. You can even help. They can even construct it with you. You can put in. You can even put in a flashlight in there. Um, if they don't want to make a whole tent, just give them a blanket, and they can cover their face. Okay, and then I said, you don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell me with your words. You can give me a thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs, you know, thumbs up, thumbs sideways, thumbs down. Um, what I also want to tell you is that if they don't answer at all, it's wonderful to have a stuffed animal or some other object in the room that you can talk to and wonder out loud. You can also wonder out loud to the parent. So talking about the child to the parent is a technique. Um, it comes from DDP and it is like saying, wow, I think your, you know, your daughter, she, she, it took her so much courage to say what she said. And now I think she's taking a break and she's, She's going inside inside that tent, and I think it's for a really good reason. She's absolutely trying to stay cooperative with us, but she's just not quite ready to um, stick her thumb out, and that's okay. So, you know, using, uh, or you can say to the teddy bear, you know, I had a teddy bear. I had a kid once that I know um, something really terrible happened. Uh, they did something that was really scary. And then it was all over. They did not want to talk about it anymore. And people kept making them talk about it. And they were just like, why do people keep talking about this? It's over. I said, I'm sorry. Nothing even happened. So you talk to the bear that, you know, and if that, that kid felt that, you know, people were kept talking about it. And that, that kid felt so frustrated, like ringing it up as if they're trying to get her in trouble. I don't know, but it could be, you know, that so-and-so that, you know, Sally feels the same way. Talking about makes it less intense than talking directly to the child. So keep the child in the conversation, just like hiding the their face keeps them in the conversation. Okay. The, Parent might be saying to you, um, he needs to come uncover his face because it's rude. You say, oh, no, mom, thank you so much for telling me that. Actually, he's trying to stay with us. He's actually he's actually trying to stay with us. And that's why he's covering his eyes. He's not doing it to be um, rude, but it's 
overwhelming to hear and see at the same time. So we're gonna we're gonna try to appreciate that he's trying to stay with us. Okay. I we went over this idea of a child who said, sometimes I wish I didn't exist. So here are some examples that you have written uh, in your um, PowerPoint. I do realize that the PowerPoint changed a little bit um, between the time that I sent it to my colleagues at PESI. So I will send an updated version um, in case it's a little different. Um, so you could say, you know, but here are some accepting statements that you would say for a child, just as an example. I'm glad to know it's on your mind. Yeah, that was really important for you to express. That took courage to express. Empathy, yeah, you're feeling super hopeless. Yeah, that's that's gonna feel horrible. Or oh, uh huh. You know, sometimes just the sound of empathy is what really transmits that you're with a person. Curiosity, hey, remember, curiosity depends on the tone. The wondering tone is much less about information gathering. It's not a analysis or a you know. Um, Fact gathering. Hey, it's not. How long have you felt that way? What's what is it? What like on what? What's the level of intensity? You know, um, when was the last time you didn't feel this way? That's more analysis or fact gathering, and you can tell the difference as opposed to hey, how long has that been going on? What what um what's it like when you feel that way? I wonder. Can you tell me more about that? Okay. Okay, so I would like to show you a video that puts this all together. Let me go ahead and um, show you the video and then I'll go back to the parent slide. So this is a video, you can see that it has been altered so the effect that you have here um, on your screen is to protect the privacy of the family. And what happened is the child uh, been, uh, he has frequent dysregulation. When he is dysregulated, it comes out as acting menacing. He chest he looks intensely at his his parent and there's the sense that he's trying to control or intimidate so what happened and, and that's something that we've been uh, talking about it has to do with his past trauma i'm not going to go into that right now um i'm just showing you the part about the regulation and how to do a deliberate dialogue so he came in upset i typically play an activity i had a, i had a, a play activity all set up for him and he was clearly upset and uh the mom told me oh it's because he was he got really upset in the car because we couldn't go to starbucks well what what that what what i later came to understand was that he was he was really aggressive in the car and that was very 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 upsetting to both of them so let me show you how um, how we handle that. Women, I was 
your secret and by doing that, that's actually a good So what we did was to sit and just calm down from the situation. And it took about 20 minutes, but you know, his, his mom cajole him and tell him to cooperate and to take his hood off. And I said, no, it's okay. We're going to let him because he's, he's trying to be cooperative, but he can't see and listen at the same time. And then I used that talking about in a prosodic voice. I talked to the mom. I didn't ask him any questions. And then I saw that he is getting, he, 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 Or try to give advice or try to make it go. just try to understand just the way he is. And if he was, if he is or was feeling really crummy, Starbucks or you know, whatever you represent it, then you just see it. Like, yeah, it's just figuring it out. That's what and that's why I was wondering if there's, if, um, might be wanting to like tell you something at all to figure out what it might be. Oh, hold on. So do you know, do you want to know something, but you don't know what it is? No. You just don't want to tell your mom? Anything right now? Okay. Um, well, can I take? Can I? Can I maybe take, take a guess at something that you might want to tell her if you could?
Skip ahead a little bit for time. I don't blame you. You know, but maybe what you wanted to tell her was what we were saying, what I was saying before, which is that you you've been trying so hard to have a good week. You were also feeling bad if you were going to not behave better. And so when this was Starbucks was coming up and you started getting like, you know, hard feelings about if you were going to disappoint her and stuff like that. Oh, okay. So this, and, it, and since you, you did, you did say, I guess, Mom did say that. Um, okay. So, hold on a second. I'm going to say that to your mom as if I'm you, and then she's going to talk back to me. I'm going to stand over here, over here, because I got to be more like this. And if, you, if I say something wrong, you just let me know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> mom, uh, all week, I really because it's so important for us that I and really well when I get upset about, about this and that and I spoke my feelings and stuff like that and I can so and I, I want to do well too mom the direction and I don't, don't want to disappoint Hard. Sometimes it's not hard. All of a sudden, I got so upset. I didn't know why. Then I got scared that the bad feelings that were gotten us in trouble got me in trouble, and that hurt you was me. It's a terrible feeling inside that I'm trying so hard to, to contain it. And that's why I look so angry on the outside. That's just part of it.
Friends, um, but I wanted to show you that at the end, remember how I said that I like to make the um, session end in with play and relaxation. And I asked him if he wanted to play something that was relaxing or something that was more active. And he said he wanted something more active, which is the activity I had before. What it is, I want to show you just what it is so you can have yet another idea, which is, okay, you take cotton balls and two cups of water, and you, they each have a pile of cotton balls. Let me show you. So you sit right there. You each get a certain amount of cotton ball into the water so that it's wet. And then you have to put on. Bye. Okay, so they're going to have a pile in front of them. They have a cup of water. You dip the cotton ball in the water. It gets really sobby, sop, sopping wet. Then you throw it at the window and it makes a huge splat. It sticks to the window and it's hilarious. It's very messy and it's incredibly satisfying, very naughty. So just wanted to show you that activity to um, inspire you. So that is what I know, what I want to show you. Now I wanted to um, let you. Know. First of all, I, I was I was hoping that you would see the structure of a session. I had planned an, a play activity out. That's why I said that it's very very flexible. I shifted to just letting him calm down and relax underneath his hood. And I made sure that his mom was also, um, you know, de-stressing by talking with her in a prosodic voice and reassuring her that it's okay and that her son is being cooperative. Um, he's not trying to be uncooperative. And then we were able to do the deliberate dialogue, which is I helped him to make, uh, we, we, if, to just get underneath Okay, he was unable to talk, but I, through the curiosity and the guessing, I asked him what it is that he was feeling and what he was feeling was that he just wanted to, you know, to be apologizing for this to be over. But then when um, they were hugging, I couldn't hear what the actual thing he was most afraid of. And she, he was whispering to her. Can you forgive me? And she said, I can forgive you, but I wonder if you can forgive yourself. And he said, I don't know. And then he said, do we still have a, did we still have a good week? So what had happened is he'd had a week where he didn't have any major explosions. He hates when he bullies his mom, for lack of a better word, uh, bullies his mom. And he was feeling um, so much as though this dysregulation that happened at the end of the day, supposedly because of Starbucks, but mostly it's just a physiologic buildup of all that um, trauma and, and um, physiologic arousal in him that he just felt like completely defeated. And so he asked, did we still have a good week? And she said, yeah, this is the best part of the week because I understand, I feel like I understand you so much more. And that is the point. It isn't a solution to his dysregulation. I'm not here to tell you that his problems are solved. I wanted the situation to, um, the, the, the climate uh, of the therapy to, for us to be able to talk about what was going on without the fear, the defensiveness, the anger, and so on. And so that really, of course, they made them feel so much better. It's that repair process. So that's what he said. Did we still have a good week? And beautifully, she said, yeah, this is the best part of the week because I understand you so much better. Okay, friends. So you might think, wow, what a fantastic parent. I don't have that kind of a parent working with me. Well, 
friends, many don't look like this at the beginning, but when you work with them and you invest in them, they are, it's miraculous what can change in terms of their, their attitude and their, their, their capacity to be open. Um, so this parent didn't start out this way, but she trusts me because of all the time that we've spent together, including those parent only sessions. Um, and so I know I said that I was focusing on the dyadic sessions only, um, and because, but there, that whole parent section is so important. I write about it extensively in the book. Uh, you're going to especially know that you need to spend more time with the parents when they say things that they're defensive. You know, they say, they say, I feel like by you making me come to the sessions and talk about my attachment history, you're main, you're bl- I feel like you're blaming me. And underneath, they feel responsible. Maybe they feel guilty for something that they did do or didn't do. They feel inadequate. They feel powerless. They feel ashamed. A lot of that does, it come, it can't come from their own attachment history. It also can come just from having a child who is got special needs, child with major sensory issues, neurodiversity, um, things like um, you just having being uh, ha- facing a lot of societal um, uh, stressors like um, financial stress and things like that. It makes you less have less capacity to regulate yourself if you're always exhausted or working two jobs and things like that and then they those are those they feel those those um, circumstances make a person feel like you're asking too much of me and that's when we have to spend time with the parents and we have to do acceptance and empathy for them as though as the same way we would do for for the for the child that is actually the parallel process that helps the parent to trust you so that they will allow you then to guide them in those dyadic sessions. So they might say things like, you know, like, I feel like you're blaming me. That's very common. Um, They also say, you know what, at some point, she just needs to listen. Okay. It doesn't matter what you are, this is all good and what you're doing. But when I have her going out on her bike after dark and she's going to the park and there's all sorts of strange men and people doing drugs at the park and she's not listening. So I'm not going to do acceptance and empathy about that. I got you. Okay. I, I hear you. Thank you so much for telling me mom about that. I hear you're trying to make her safe and that it sounds to me like you are scared out of your mind for her and you are really worried okay i get it you know what you're doing your job as a mom right you're protecting her i get it i i and and so you're going to do that um acceptance and empathy you don't necessarily you're not going to go into well what i'm saying is is her brain is impulsive because she's traumatized or because of her um Developmental level, we are going to, at those times, do not do psychoeducation. Do the acceptance and empathy with the parent to try to help them to feel supported. You might have to tell them a hard truth at the end, which is that you do not have control of, over your child. Um, and if we're going to get into a situation where you're yanking on her, where you're having to yell and scream and threaten her, then there might, it, it's actually making her more distanced from you. And so I think it's, we're going to have to come up with a way of you having um, the capacity to let go to some degree and tolerate the fear. Okay. And you, you utilize your your um, your community or um, or prayer if that's relevant to you. Um, but there's got to be an element here where you might have to tell them uh, the truth, some sort of hard truth about what's what um, what they're up against and what they're responsible for. You know, not yanking on it or not uh, hitting, um, threatening and cursing. Um, you know, those kinds of things are making it worse. 
And so we're going to have to go back to those regulate those those um, regulation exercises. Okay. So uh, that's just a little bit. I do not have time to talk about the parent um, issues, and I recommend that the um, you know for those of you who are interested to um, read about it in the uh, maybe you could even order it in the library. Um, I'm I'm here to. Um, ask questions. If you have questions, you can find me here. And I am um, going to ask my colleague now to um, help with some, some of the Q&A that came in. We have a little bit of time now. We have 15 minutes. So I'm checking the um, questions. So are there video videos available to show the activities to clients? Okay, I'm in a wheelchair and can't move down on the floor and move as easily. So if I can show a visual, that would be great. Well, okay. So um, I will say that there is a compilation of videos that we did online um but they sh they still demonstrate the the activities um and it is available on the theraplay.org website and when you go to theraplay.org it's not on my website it's on ther www.theraplay.org you will be able to go to um a tab called webinars um i'm happy to write it in the chat um and let me see if I can write it in the chat. I wrote it in the chat. It's therapy.org and there's a tab called webinars and the videos. There's two of them called uh, online therapy activities. If you're unable to locate it for some reason, I would just, I would uh, email the Fair Play Institute. That's because you're looking for videos. Um, I understand that you're looking for videos because of your, uh, you're wanting to show the parents because you're not able to go on the floor um, and do the activities. Um, yourself and you need some some assistance with that so that makes sense okay let's see okay um how here's a question how do you handle parents that feel that they don't need family counseling um i it's a premise that i start with that the uh first of all let me go back a second maybe they don't need family counseling I, 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 what I assume is that every clinician has a way of figuring out what the main problem is and what the parent and what the family's already tried and where they're at in their, in, in their, you know, therapy, what juncture they're at in their therapy. Uh, have they had therapy before, et cetera? Is the parent, uh, is the child willing to work with the parent? Are they so far gone and it's a teenager? In other words, there's, there's going to be a part where you're going to do the um, conceptualization of the case, okay? And so there could be parents who, they're, they're, uh, it's not appropriate for them to be in this family therapy setting. And however, if you are offering the family therapy approach, it's because you think that there's utility in working on the parent child relationship and you have some, and you have some hope that both parties are, are open and interested. Um, if that is the case, then you would just tell them, this is the way I think you're going to get the most out of the, 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 the time and the effort and the money that you are going to be spending. And I don't want to waste your time um with other modalities and you are the most important person to your child you're also the most powerful agent of change in the relationship that's my um point of view 
And then if they don't feel that they're interested in that, then it's up to you. Do you work with a child alone? It's up to your um, uh, clinical philosophy and your agency's, you know, your organizational philosophy. So. Okay, we have a question about how we would work with parents who are highly dissociative and have difficulty regulating because of zoning out or being aloof, distracted, imagining, et cetera. I think that if that's your assessment, it's really good to be playful. So just bop a balloon back and forth with a parent and child. Get them to eat themselves, like eating something crunchy or eating something chewy or drinking something with ice. OK, um, give them stuff to do with their hands, like have the parent do Play-Doh with their hands or make something. So be aware that they're that the, it's actually the the sensory things that keep a person in the here and now and then be extremely concrete and short with those conversations. So tell the child, OK, kid. You were bothered by this. Why don't you say something like, mom, when you, you know, went out with um, your friend and um, I was alone having to babysit my brother, I didn't like that. Why don't you just say that? Okay, mom, why don't you say, got it, thanks for letting me know. And I could sure understand that if you're um, feeling um, scared yourself, that it would, it would be yucky to be left alone as a babysitter. Can you say something like that? So be really concrete and then say, mom, kid, you make a really good team just by being able to talk about this. Okay, now let's do a special handshake like with four parts. And the you, mom, you do one, you do kid, you do two. Uh, mom, you do third part, kid, you do four part. And then like, or like have a dance party or something like that. Does that make sense? I hope that, uh, I feel, pretty strongly about that one because I know exactly what you're talking about. And it has to be where it's almost like the child that the parent is also a child in this. Of course, you know, it is it's my assumption that you would be working with the parent alone and and helping them in those parent only sessions. But my a lot of people will say, well, then I'm not going to work with that parent and child together. Well, they spend the rest of their time together during the week together. It's not like he, you can, you know, um, prevent the child from being exposed to the parent's dysregulation and zoning out. So if you can keep that hour safe and do something positive, that in and of itself is a contribution. Um, okay, I mostly work with adults, and I'm curious if some of these tools applied here in the structure could be used with adults who may feel that they're missing some of the secure attachment from their, yes, yes, you can. So some of the secure attachment from their caregiver, um, you can, um, being playful, um, providing nurturance of some kind is a very nice thing to do, yes. Be aware that certain people are going to react very strongly and that they could get a um, even more bonded to you as a therapist. So just be really aware of that counter-transference and just be, you have to be pretty, um, you have to be a seasoned therapist and have supervision in order to do more of the attachment behaviors. We all do it as therapists. We're always caregiving for our clients just by being empathic. But if you are going to give them a blanket and if you are going to, you know, give them a hot drink and always remember how they like their tea and all that, um, you know, um, uh, the things that you do that are extra make certain clients who are already have maybe um, not the best boundaries have even more of a, a, a bonding reaction to you. Um, so you're going to use your judgment about that. Oh, wow. Thanks so much for asking. I really am touched by this question. Has this been done with juvenile justice population? I work with adolescents who are incarcerated, and most parents are either hopeless or minimize their child's behavior and are not engaged in therapy. 
Um, I get it. And I'm, I'm, I'm really sympathetic to this situation. Um, even though the parents feel hopeless or dismissing, it's worth it. If there's a one in a hundred chance that a spark of connection or a like ray of light happens between them where the parent sees their child as a child for one minute and not as, you know, this like thug or somebody who's like totally lost or, um, you know, blaming the child, it's it will have been worth it. Um, and if the parents aren't engaged in therapy, just do everything you can to make them feel like you value them, that they're so important, that they're, um, you know, that you respect them so much, that they're so courageous, that you believe that they've done everything they can, that they're trying as hard as they can. I really want you to lay it on thick from that point of view. Okay, advice on getting children comfortable, including parents in their treatment. Well, I'm assuming you you are already. So you've already been working with this child and the it's individual therapy um because if it's a new client i would set it up that way from the beginning okay um i am suggesting that you do the following you say hey guess what last week i went to a training about doing about having parents and children um, talk together in therapy, and it seemed intriguing. So, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to have your parent come in for like 20 minutes of the session. Um, they might be like, No way. And you say, Oh, okay, okay. Then we won't. Just tell me, can you tell me more about that? Like, what's your initial reaction? What do you think might happen? And, um, you know, that they might have very good reasons. Uh, why? But maybe if, you know, maybe if it's just their initial shock of it or they're not used to the idea, you could, you know, give them a little preview of what you might do and let them know. Don't let your their parent lecture that on and on and on. Mm -hmm. How about touching clients? Wouldn't that be murky territory these days? I don't think so. Um, I think that there's a uh, a rationale to providing touch between parents and children. That's for sure. Um, I think that when it's with with children, they need touch, especially um, you know safe touch. If you don't provide safe touch for somebody who only had bad touch, they think that they're only useful for bad touch, and they have no way of getting um, safe touch, and it just sets them up for more victimization. And I, in a way, I would argue that do you, anybody who's been to physical therapy, there is always a rationale and it's explained why, And um, but the therapist does work with your body. And all of the attachment research and all of the neurobiology talks so much about touch there is a uh, need for us to be able to safely model that. And so with explanation and with attunement, I think it's really, uh, it's really important. Um, okay, so I think we're going to have time for one more question. This last question, can you please discuss how you would approach this with a child who's on the spectrum and nonverbal? Um, Okay, so the activities, um, the play and relaxation is wonderful for children who, children who are on the spectrum. And it is really a nonverbal interaction. The, 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 uh, the playfulness, the calming, you know, that's the rhythm. They really respond so well to that. As far as the, the deliberate dialogue, I've been able to do it where I've been able to sort of guess at and give voice to the child. And I sense that the child has some understanding of the affect, the tone, the intention, and have been successful in talking for the child. 
Um, I had a child who uh, would constantly hurt his mom. And it was a way of him to, uh, he, it was his way of communicating with her. Sometimes he was striking out just to, um, you know, to reach out to her. Uh, perhaps sometimes so depressed that he was sort of trying to be provocative. And so what I did, you know, she said when he hurt her and then he um, almost was getting dysregulated and wanting to smack her again. I said, oh, oh, are you worried that you're, you're feeling like a bad boy because you hurt your mom? Okay, that makes sense. And I took his hand and I said, do you want to, do you want to say sorry, mommy? And his hand over her hand and just said like that. And he, yeah, so I feel like you could do it um, very concrete, concretely, the, the, the um, deliberate dialogue. It's the play part for sure is going to be really successful. Okay, friends, I um, come to the end of our um, time together. I urge you to work, work with parents and children together in the room. And let, let me know if you have, have any questions. Be well, everybody. Thank you.